Hello and welcome to the emergency medicine lecture. We're going to cover a large number of topics today. Um, several things are going to be review from previous modules, at least using the same drugs, but maybe applying them in different contexts. Uh, let's start with the, the basics on what happens usually before somebody gets into an emergency department or uh, prior to their hospital presentation, and that would be paramedic or uh, emergency medical services. So paramedics and EMTs uh, have different functions. Depending on the state you live in, they might be licensed differently, but in Minnesota, paramedics, the big difference is they have more training and they can administer medications, where EMTs, um, EMTs actually can give some basic meds, but not um, anything on this list, really. So that's going to be your big difference. Usually, um, there's at least one paramedic on an ambulance. Uh, they might have a combination where one's a paramedic, one's an EMT. Or they might both be paramedics. But you do need one paramedic on an ambulance, otherwise you can't really give any meds. And then it kind of defeats the purpose of some of the early um, responses that are life-saving that a paramedic can do. So anyway, basically they have a limited amount of medications, but it's a pretty good scope of what they can treat. And it's all the initial phases of CV emergencies, pain medications, including even some narcotics. They usually have um, not a lot of choices. Like they might just have fentanyl, for example, and nothing else. Or they might just have um, midazolam as their benzodiazepine and nothing else. So they don't have like, you know, choice of four different benzos or opioids like we would at the hospital. They just have one option, which is usually enough for most patients or to get them by until they can get to the hospital. Um, dextrose uh, for low blood sugar, naloxone for opioid reversal, sedatives and paralytics um, for intubation or airway management if they need to. And again, it's going to, the companies or protocols are going to vary depending on what they have, but they should have a pretty decent supply of stuff. They're going to also have everything like for cardiovascular emergency you might need. So all your ACLS type medications that we're going to go through in a few slides here. Um, access is really important, so access should be done quickly. If you can't get an IV on your patient or if your nurses are struggling to get an IV, you should direct them to give an IO. Oftentimes the IOs come in from the field where they needed to give something emergently and they just didn't really have time with two people to to give get an IV started with everything else that was going on. I've got some videos on there. I think you guys have probably seen what, what administering an IO is like, but they're kind of cool. Um, especially to see in real life. So starting by talking about rapid sequence intubation, or RSI, this is uh, protecting a patient's airway, so giving them an uh, option to breathe for various reasons. So anything from cardiac arrest to a drug overdose could um, result in somebody need to be intubated, or maybe they just need to go to a procedure emergently or something like that, and you need to sedate them for intubation. Um, rapid means rapid, just like it says. This is a fast process. It should only take a few minutes at most to complete. So um, the first step is induction, and the big part of this is to give this agent first. The reason is, is you want your patient sedated before you paralyze them. If you paralyze a person who is awake, um, you know, you risk some complications, but ultimately you're going to put a breathing tube in them. So you, they're going to be able to breathe, but they're going to be panicking because you can imagine if you were awake and somebody gave you a medicine that paralyzed you and you couldn't do anything, you feel pretty uncomfortable. Um, so certainly we want people to not remember that they've been paralyzed and that's a, a big goal here. So induction, you can also refer to or think about as sedation. So this is going to be a fast onset, short acting sedative used in relatively high doses compared to how we might use them in other capacities. You might not necessarily need um, an induction agent. Like for example, if somebody comes in in a cardiac arrest, they're in, um, I don't know, asystole or PEA, they're getting a, have, having CPR, they're not responding to any commands. That person's unconscious anyway, so there's no real reason to give them an induction agent. You aren't going to do anything with that. So at that point, you might need to paralyze them to, to help the RSI process. But um, so you have to use your judgment with that. If the person shows any signs of consciousness, you should probably use an induction agent, even if they've like taken an overdose of a medication. 
if they're still with it a little bit, it's probably best to give them something else on top of that. Again, you are ultimately giving this person an airway, so overdoing it a little bit on the sedation or even the paralytic, it's not a big deal. You probably want to err on the side of more versus less. Um, you don't really want somebody to have to remember that they got a tube shoved down their throat and they're paralyzed. That's a pretty uncomfortable and slightly traumatic experience for anybody, uh, so we want to make sure people don't remember it. All right, so one of the most popular medications is Etomidate, which is a really short-acting sedative. It lasts less than 10 minutes. It's a non-barbiturate hypnotic. It's kind of got like a GABA-type mechanism of potentiating the inhibitory effects of the GABA pathways. Um, it's somewhat related to clonidine, too, which is kind of interesting. That's another topic. So anyway, um, the nice thing about Etomidate is not only is it short-acting, but it has a very neutral effect on blood pressure overall. Um, so if you have patients who have unstable pressures, um, you can use this usually without any complications. I've never seen Etomidate drop somebody's blood pressure appreciably, and it, I've used it probably hundreds of times for uh, intubations. It might cause slight hypotension, but again, I don't think it's enough really to ever tip the scales uh, for anyone's favor. Ketamine is an NM, we've talked about ketamine before as an NMDA receptor antagonist, blocks glutamate, um, usually causes hypertension. So if you have somebody whose pressures are low and you want to bump them up a little, little bit, ketamine's nice. Ketamine has some complications associated with it. You have to give it kind of slowly. Etomidate, you can just push in. You can just, you know, give the whole syringe. The nurse can just basically slam it in the patient. They're going to get knocked out very quickly. Um, ketamine, if you do that, they can get sort of a um, a reaction where their throat spasms and they get sort of a, uh, they call it laryngospasm or the patient might experience like a dysphasic, dysphagic um, feeling and they also might feel very uncomfortable with that medication because it just, it doesn't play nice with the body. So um, recommend if you are using ketamine to make sure you remind your nurses to give that slowly um, just because um, they might not know that or they might forget or whatever. Um, there's a lot going on in these situations, so it's easy to say, all right, let's give ketamine. And, you know, your pharmacist or your nurse has the ketamine and just kind of pushes it in because it's a rapid sequence of intubation. You do it fast. And then all of a sudden your patient's super uncomfortable. <laughs> so ketamine also takes a little bit longer to work um, than etomidate. It's got a slower onset of activity. I mean, you're talking about seconds, like 30 second difference maybe, but that does matter when you're doing all this. And the big thing is, is to make sure that your patient's sedative is kicked in before you paralyze them. That's another mistake I've seen occasionally where somebody pushes a sedative and then immediately pushes the paralytic right after that. And it's like, well, um, you want to wait until the patient is actually out before you give the paralytic, unless, you know, it's really emergent and you don't have another choice. Um, give it a couple minutes to work at least a full minute, I say, which is kind of hard when all these people are standing around and you've got an emergency situation going on. Waiting a minute for a drug to kick in is painful sometimes, but it's usually the right decision. Propofol is rarely ever used as an induction agent just because its onset is pretty slow and it does cause more hypotension than the other medications, so we don't use this. However, if somebody's blood pressure is good, propofol is the most common agent we're going to give to sustain their sedation. So after somebody's been intubated, um, they need some sort of long-acting sedative on board, especially once that paralytic starts to wear off and that initial induction agent starts to wear off, they're going to start coming back out of it, so you're going to need to suppress the, them with a sedative of some kind, and propofol is the most common one we use. Um, fentanyl and Versed are used sometimes, but I rarely ever see them used for induction. What I will see them used for is the follow-up sedation after the intubation has taken place. And the nice thing about fentanyl and Versed is they have very little effects on blood pressure. So if you, again, have that person who's hypotensive, you can give them that and they, they'll stay mostly normal as far as their blood pressure goes. Paralysis. So this is the second medication you give. I've also I've mentioned this a bunch uh, already on the other slide. It's kind of hard not to talk about them in, in tandem. Uh, but this is, again, going to be the second medication you give. And to wait until that sedative kicks in before you give it. Um, succinylcholine is probably the most common one that's used. I think it really depends on provider preference, to be honest. I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason to who why you pick what. There's a couple ideas of uh, theories around them, but succinylcholine is really fast. And so when you are intubating somebody, you really don't want your 
paralysis to last a long time, uh, depending on you know what you're trying to do. Because intubation should take less than 10 minutes. So 10 minute window of paralysis is perfect in most cases. And you don't want sustained paralysis in you know 99% of situations. So to get them paralyzed so that you can get the the intubation completed without any resistance from the patient um, is key, and succinylcholine is a good drug for that because it's really short acting. So succinylcholine depolarizes the motor end plate. It's similar to acetylcholine, but it just lasts longer. So essentially, what you get is a sustained muscle paralysis uh, because your <clears throat> your nerves can't repolarize. And what happens is that eventually succinylcholine just disappears. It kind of gets metabolized by esterases and other things that are in the blood. And it just has a very short half-life. It doesn't last very long. And once that's gone, then your nerves can repolarize and do everything like that. The contraindications to um, succinylcholine specifically are people with hyperkalemia. So in some cases, if you don't have time to get a lab or if you suspect like muscle trauma or anything where there's been significant tissue damage that might cause potassium to leak out into the systemic circulation, that's going to be something where you might want to be careful with. You don't want to induce hyperkalemia and cause more problems than, than you have to begin with. So a lot of people, if they don't aren't sure about the patient, they might just use rocuronium because succinylcholine has that possible risk with it. Um, and that's because it does leave those potassium channels open. So when you give it, it does cause a transient increase in potassium. So if you have somebody who's got normal potassium levels and you give succinylcholine, it will elevate their potassium slightly. But again, that's going to be really short lived. It won't really have a big effect. Where that has a problem is if, let's like, say, you have your patient who's missed dialysis and they're going into a cardiac arrest and they're already really hyper K you're going to, um, you could possibly push them over and, and make that arrest more complicated and severe than you need to. So succinylcholine, just for those reasons, that's probably the biggest issue with it. Um, rocuronium is uh, a slightly slower onset. So this is one where I feel like even experienced providers get frustrated with it because it's like, it just takes a little bit of time to work. Um, it does take like a full, like succinylcholine is almost instant. You give it and it's basically, you're paralyzed. Rocuronium might take about a minute uh, to, to kick in. And again, those minutes can be excruciating during a situation like this, especially when you're the pharmacist and everybody's staring at you like, why isn't your drug working? It's like, well, first of all, I didn't make the drug. Second of all, you got to give it some time. And um, that's really the case. So some patients might be more sensitive or, or whatnot, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's a slower onset medication. It does last longer. It lasts 20 to 30 minutes. Some providers might like that because they have the extra window of opportunity. If you have a patient who might be a difficult intubation, it might be nice from the start to use rock for that reason. Um, I have no personal preference. If somebody wants to use sucks or rock, I don't really care. The only reason why is I would make sure the sucks, um, if you're going to use sucks, that you have some sort of idea of what the potassium might be, or you don't have any thoughts that the potassium might be elevated. Um, Vecuronium is the other option. It's got a slower onset than rock. It lasts about the same amount of time. And if you dose rock uranium on the higher end, you're probably going to get the same half-life. So you got 30 minutes or so. Some people think VEC lasts longer, and I don't know if that, I mean, I don't know if 10 minutes within the range is really appreciable or not. It probably doesn't matter. VEC uranium is also a powder, so you have to reconstitute it, which slows down the process a little bit as well. So overall, we don't really use VEC uranium. Um, the nice thing about it is that succinylcholine and rock uranium are not room temperature stable. They need to be stored in a refrigerator. So you might see vecuronium used in, in areas where they don't have refrigerated access to medications. That's probably the biggest issue. So we use it sometime in like our procedural areas. They might use it, keep, keep some on hand as an um, emergency type thing so that they can pull it out and they don't have to run to a place that does have a medication fridge stocked. Uh, both VEC and ROC work the same way. They block acetylcholine from binding to receptors on the motor end plate, inhibiting depolarization. They work um, differently from succinylcholine. So you, instead of working on the, um, on the depolarization system, you're actually blocking the receptor from acting that way. So a little bit different, same concept overall, though.
Uh, it goes without saying probably that these are really dangerous medications. There's a lot of restrictions around them because if you do paralyze somebody and you don't have airway support immediately ready, you can kill somebody. And there have been issues with that where people have messed up and given vecuronium instead of something else because, you know, look-alike, sound-alike type drug. There's actually a big case out east somewhere where this kind of blows my mind, but I'll use it as an example. Some uh, a nurse pulled uh, vecuronium, and she was instructed to pull Versed, which you know brand name of midazolam. So again, using a brand name instead of the generic uh, caused some issues. So she went and typed in VE to her you know dispensing system, got vecuronium out, and then gave it. Now there's so many issues here. The vecuronium is reconstituted. It's it's a big vial of powder, um, and there'd be a lot of times you would think that you would have noticed that you're giving completely the wrong medication um, and Versed is like usually comes in a small vial it's liquid it's just very different looking um, so I don't know what exactly the background was to it but certainly a lot of issues but anyway it kind of caused this big scare around the U.S. about oh we need to be careful with our paralytics so these are kept very tightly we like we don't store them you can't just go into one of our dispensing cabinets in a, in a hospital and pull out a bunch of paralytics. You actually have to pull out a kit, and that's what this is. Um, so this is actually an, an example of what uh, an RSI kit, these are the ones we use at our hospital, although we updated the, the stuff a little bit, but it's basically the same thing. So what you have here, this is the back of it, looks like a little tackle box. You've got your etomidate, you've got some rocuronium vials, and you've got a succinylcholine vial. You also might have something to bump up blood pressure. So this is a phenylephrine stick. And so that's, uh, again, to review back to last fall, that's a peripheral vasoconstrictor. So it helps support central pressures. And uh, if you do get a little bit of a blood pressure drop during your RSI, you could give some bumps of that and that should get you through um, until the medications wear off. Um, so that might be something you see as part of a kit as well. So. Um, the kits are handy and they might have like a guide of dosing, what the average doses are and those types of things, some little pearls of wisdom. Um, so for example, it says ketamine, onsets, durations, all that kind of stuff there. So anyway, there's some information there that gives you uh, clues as to how to dose. And it's nice when you're in an emergency and you grab the kit, it's got everything you need and then you can go. Uh, and do it. And the reason, again, why we do that in a kit, we don't usually do kits anymore because they're they're annoying for a lot of reasons from a logistical perspective. But in this case, it keeps the paralytic secure. You know what it's used for. They're locked. They have this little like pull tag on them, so you can't just open it and take the stuff out. You have to actually rip the lock off. So there's a lot of safety protocols around it. We also tend to label the vials with these little tags on them so that it says may cause respiratory paralysis uh, or paralytic may cause respiratory arrest or something like that anyway there's a there's some extra added thing where if you're going to flip the top you might actually look at the sticker and say oh yeah this is actually paralytic so we do try and be uh, take safety seriously in the hospital when it comes to this high risk medications and these are about as high risk as you can get because if you gave them on accident in a situation where you didn't have airway support it could be fatal for the patient so definitely something we need to watch out for but fortunately we have a lot of safeguards around it so enough about that uh, conscious sedation is essentially like uh, an induction for an RSI, but usually we're using propofol because this isn't generally emergent. So it's stuff for like um, cardioversions, hip shoulder reductions, any other painful or invasive procedure. Like if you're doing a laceration repair on a child and they're moving around a lot, you might want to do a little bit of conscious sedation. And the basic idea here is you're sedating the patient, you're causing some amnesia, you might be giving some analgesic relief as well, although that's not, not always the case and not necessary. Um, and in that in those situations, all you really want is a short-acting sedative. You don't want the patient paralyzed. You want the patient to be able to breathe, uh, but you don't want them to remember it. So, for example, a cardioversion takes only a few seconds once you get them on the hooked up to pads and everything like that. So you get them all ready. Usually, we use propofol for these cases almost exclusively, um, and it does cause some hypotension. So that would be the case where you might switch to something else. And you can use etomidate, you can use ketamine for conscious sedations as well. I've heard anecdotally that um, people like ketamine in kids because for some reason, if you give kids propofol, they, they wiggle around a lot, whereas ketamine, they stay still. Um, in adults, it's almost the opposite. People move around a little bit more on ketamine. So if you're going to do like a, a reduction, you might want to avoid ketamine or yeah, avoid ketamine. 
Uh, propofol, again, causes some hypotension. In a, in a conscious sedation, you probably aren't using enough to really give an, a you know, big response to the blood pressure. You might see a little bit of a drop, but I wouldn't I wouldn't get too concerned about it unless the blood pressure is quite, quite low to begin with. So propofol is a great choice. Um, the big things to remember are allergic to eggs or soybeans. It's a uh, an emulsion. And so if you don't have that, um, if you don't have that history, ask the patient before you start the conscious sedation. I've got a video here of showing somebody um, getting a cardioversion done. If you want to watch what it actually looks like, if you've never seen it before, the interesting thing about conscious sedation is the person will seem like they're arousable and awake, but for propofol especially, they won't remember it. It's it causes amnesia, and so they probably are experiencing pain and feeling things for sure because they'll actually react, but they won't remember they, that anything happened. So it's like, did the pain occur? If they don't remember it, it's a good question, but. Um, You'll see people react like if you shock their chest, they'll sit up, they'll they'll cry out, they'll hold their their you know their hands to their chest or something like that. They'll have some kind of a reaction. It's rare to see somebody so out of it they don't react at all when you shock them. Um, same thing with hips and shoulder reductions; they're painful. So if somebody's manipulating you, um, you probably are going to have the person you know saying ow 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 or crying a little bit while they're doing it, but they won't remember that when the procedure's over. Um, let's work, and then, so that's a big topic that we really haven't talked about before and some drugs we haven't really talked about in detail yet. So um, otherwise, for emergency medicine, sort of work our way through review of systems and talk about the major topics. Uh, so stroke is going to be the biggest thing you're probably going to see from a neurology perspective in the ER uh, or stroke-like symptoms. So strokes are a very sequential protocol-driven process. You activate your code stroke team, uh, first step. You figure out if it's ischemic or hemorrhagic. That's usually done by imaging. So you send them to CT. If they are ischemic, you decide, are they a candidate for TPA administration? And if so, you're going to give it very quickly. And step four would be to manage the symptoms after that. Um, time is brain. So there's studies that show that the faster you intervene in a stroke, the better. So um, less brain damage overall, then we have a uh, we have a situation where we want to be quick, but also thorough with all of our steps. All right, let's talk about intracerebral hemorrhage first. Let's talk about, talk about brain bleeding. Um, this is something where you want to, first of all, make sure you're holding any antiplatelet agents, any uh, anticoagulants can get reversed if you need to. So we're going to talk about PCC here, which is the common one, but there's some other options as well with the newer drugs. You want to manage the patient um, aggressively usually so we're normally going to give one of two medications to these patients in addition to maybe giving uh, an uh, <clears throat> anticoagulant reversal the first is mannitol well, mannitol is not as favored anymore we're usually using hypertonic saline and the idea here is that you actually pull water out of free uh, pull free water out of cells and you shift the um, concentration gradient within the central nervous nervous system so that um, the swelling, uh, the, the blood, the bleeding goes down some, so it's not bleeding out quite as much. Um, IV mannitol is, uh, is, was kind of the old standard, and hypertonic saline's kind of taken that. So if you look at this, this isn't a typo. This is actually 23%. If you remember back to our electrolyte lecture, remember I gave you a lot of warnings about using 3% saline. So this is a really high concentration of saline, and um, the, the one thing to remember about brain bleeds is they're often... Um, either fatal or the patient has a very difficult time recovering from them. So that's why they're managed so aggressively. So you give a huge bolus of saline, you hope to pull free water out of the cells and shift the balance so the, the bleed kind of stems itself off a little bit while well, you have maybe buys you some time to get to a surgical intervention if the patient's appropriate for that. Um, you can use mannitol as well. You can use both of them if you want to, but usually it's one or the other. Blood pressure is also a big deal, which we're going to talk about that. Most of these patients are hypertensive, and so we're going to want to drop their blood pressure at the same time. Um, so I think about these patients with, a, with an intracranial hemorrhage from three perspectives. Blood pressure management, your um, anticoagulation reversal, and then the uh, intracranial pressure relief. And ultimately, you're going to have other things too, like sedation and, and possible intubations as well. So these can be really complicated patients with a lot of medication-related things going on at one time. 
Um, reversing anticoagulation, so warfarin historically is the most common concern, but now with the new anticoagulants being so popular, everything is fair game at this point. Uh, fortunately, we're using PCC basically for everything right now um, because it's been shown to be more effective overall, at least at our site locally, than um, using a drug like um, adenexent alpha, which is the new reversal agent for the factor 10A inhibitors. So PCC we've talked about before, uh, but it's um, usually you're giving K-Centra, which is a four factor. It's just purified human factors from human blood products. So you give a bunch of factors into somebody and you essentially can re instantly reverse their anticoagulation. So somebody comes in and their warfarin has been mismanaged or they've been sick and their INR is nine. And now it's, you give them PCC like within 20 minutes, it's going to be, you recheck an INR, you're going to see it down to like one. It's really cool how fast it works. Uh, the dosing is pretty easy. It's based on INR and it's based on administration. Now, when it comes to other drugs, like if you're using it to reverse rivaroxaban or apixaban, that gets trickier and there's different guidelines about that and there's different protocols out there. So it might be institutional related and I'm not going to talk about it, but it usually falls somewhere in here. Like if somebody is on rivaroxaban, they usually say, let's just use 50 units per kilo and call it good. Um, it's a really expensive medication. It costs about 25 grand for a full dose. You also, if the patient's on warfarin, you want to make sure you start vitamin K2. The reason why is you'll get sustained um, clotting factor production in the patient over time. So PCC doesn't last very long, and so you want something on board to keep the um, clotting factor production rolling so that the patient doesn't just slip right back into an anticoagulated state once the PCC and it gets out of the system. Um, Pradaxa has this drug called Praxbind, and Pradaxa is where, where we can use PCC for factor 10 A's. There's less good data about using it for Pradaxa or Dabigatran, and so Praxbind is the drug for that, which Pradaxa is not a super common medication, so at the end of the day, you don't see it very often, but there is a special agent for both of those, but we um, we don't really use them. We just use PCC, with maybe the exception of Pradaxa, where we'd use the, the Praxbind drug, but I've never seen that ordered. Uh, acute ischemic stroke. So if you have ischemic stroke, you're going to go down this pathway, and essentially it's, it's a little easier. You're basically looking at whether or not the patient qualifies for Alteplase, or tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA. So your ED provider, your stroke neurologist, and radiology are usually going to be talking. And um, like, for example, like our stroke neurologists take this really seriously, and they love fast door-to-needle times, which means the time patient gets to the hospital to the time we administer TPA. And so usually as pharmacists, we're actually alerted to this, and the, the provider might say, this is probably a TPA candidate. Get your person ready. So I'll call our IV room. They'll start making it. Then the neurologist, I follow them, I go with them into the CT scanner and I just kind of stand around pretending like I know what I'm doing and then they finally say yes or no and then I call and go get the med and then you know it's all good after that. <laughs> but it's really expensive so there's always that little give and take on well let's wait a little bit to make sure we don't waste it but Fortunately, the company that makes TPA understands that and does give us a credit if we don't use a product. Anyway, um, with TPA, the major considerations are time frame, bleeding, um, whether they have an anticoagulation on board or not, and blood pressure. So time frame has to be uh, outside of usually under three hours or under four and a half hours if you want to extend it a little bit. That's the common presentation now. If you have an unknown symptom start time, that's an immediate contraindication for TPA. Um, so if patient woke up that morning with stroke-like symptoms, you don't know when it happened during the night. That's not a TPA uh, candidate. Bleeding, any type of history of bleeding, recent surgeries, um, anticoagulation, anything like that is going to contraindicate you. Um, blood pressure, so blood pressure has to be under 185 uh, systolic and so or 105 diastolic. And so we're looking at labetalol. It's lo easy, it's long acting, it's my preferred drug in this case. Otherwise, uh, drips might work too, um, like nicardipine is a great choice uh, for a drip as well, if you want to give sustained blood pressure support that way.
Um, you can, so if the blood pressure comes, if the patient comes in, their blood pressure is high, if you can manage it medically, you can still give TPA. So it's not like a contraindication unless you aren't managing the blood pressure. Migraines. Uh, migraines are a really common presentation to the ER. Usually patients have some kind of a care plan from their neurologist. If they don't, the general strategy is to avoid narcotics. So you want to see if they've tried or maxed out their tryptan at home. Usually patients have, have something like that. So they might have come in and taken a dose of sumatriptan. Um, make sure you discuss with somebody if you don't understand the dosing of these to figure out how, what their max is. So for example, with sumatriptan, your max is 200 milligrams a day. And usually the most you can take at one time is 100 milligrams. So if a patient has the high dose 100, they can take two of those before they're maxed out on triptans. Um, the intranasal or sub-Q have equivalent dosing too. So like if you use one sub-Q dose of sumatriptan, we talked about that during migraines as being a really fast acting option. You can do an additional 100 milligrams oral or an additional sub-Q shot. So that kind of takes the place of the high oral dose, if that makes sense. But anyway, the, the important part of this is to make sure you you know what your dose max is. And you can look that stuff up really easily at the time because, you know, there's tons of triptans out there. And so knowing all of them off the top of your head is sort of ridiculous. But there's uh, there's good resources out there to look that stuff up. Um, Dihydroergotamine, if they haven't used uh, triptan, could be an option to consider. Otherwise, in most cases, you know, the general person who's coming into the ER for a migraine probably has used triptans outside of the hospital, just in most cases. So these are not really things you're going to consider because they're probably maxed on their dose already. So your choices are other pain medications and other things we've talked about. And we talked about migraine already, so I'm not really going to rehash this too much other than to say you're essentially looking at, you know, IV ketorolac or IM ketorolac and then things like um, antiemetics, so like prochlorperazine is a really common choice, but technically any antiemetic could work. Uh, those are sort of your first line options that you would try. After that, you've got IV belproic acid, IV methylprednisolone, and then ultimately narcotics. We talked about these briefly during the benzo lecture as well, but just to review status epilepticus, since it's another common um, neurologic presentation, you have benzos are going to be your primary treatment choice for the acute phase. And so any three benzodiazepine listed there is fine. Um, you'll notice EMS will give midazolam because that's what they carry with them. But midazolam is the shortest acting one, so that's the biggest problem with it. Uh, it does buy EMS some time to get them into the hospital. But once they get there, you probably want to start dosing with lorazepam. Um, lorazepam, just as a side note, it's a refrigerated medication, so that's why EMS doesn't carry it. Diazepam uh, is another option too. And remember just to review the differences between lorazepam and diazepam and why we like lorazepam. Remember, diazepam is a more lipophilic medication, so it actually gets into the central nervous system faster and stops can potentially stop a seizure very quickly, but it also distributes back out and into fatty tissues. And so your concentrations quickly drop in the central nervous system from what's what they were. Lorazepam is slower acting because it's not as lipophilic. It does get into the central nervous system. It takes some more time. Once it gets in there, it stays in there at high concentrations and it has a sustained effect, whereas diazepam um, will take some time to get that sustained effect built back up as it redistributes and, and goes across concentration gradients into different tissues. So um, while diazepam is fast and it was the gold standard for status epilepticus for a long time, lorazepam is essentially the exclusive one we use in the hospital for that. So um, if you manage the seizure with benzodiazepines, you can't, you don't want to continue doing that. That's not a sustainable strategy. So usually you want to give something long acting that a person could potentially be switched to um, orally or possibly replace their um, anti-epileptic if they were you know, not adherent with something or missed a few doses of, of a drug. So your options are really uh, IV levetiracetam, IV phosphenitoin. Those are going to be the two most common ones. IV phenobarb and IV propofol are really rare. I don't really see those used as much. Um, you could make an argument for IV valproic acid. Um, but the problem with that is it's not as good as stopping a seizure acutely. So there, there's a little bit of a nuance here to discuss. So if you, you can use IV levetiracetam or Keppra acutely to stop a seizure in place or in addition to benzodiazepine. It'll work really well for that. There's a lot of good data that supports that. IV valproic acid, 
doesn't really work as well in the acute phase. However, if you control somebody's seizure with a benzodiazepine and it's like, and they take valproic acid as an outpatient orally and they, you know, they miss some doses and that's why they're in status, it's probably a good idea to, to reload them on it and not like restart them on Keppra or something like that. So there are situations where valproic acid makes sense IV, but for the general patient, um, if the benzos aren't working or if you want a longer acting strategy, you're probably going to go with IV Keppra in most cases. It's much better tolerated than phosphenitoin and it's going to have easier long-term strategy to convert somebody to an oral therapy if you wanted to go down that route in the future. All right. Meningitis. True bacterial meningitis is really rare, but it's uh, incredibly problematic for the patient. It can be high fatality rate. Uh, so if you suspect it, lumbar puncture, get a CSF sample, culture, et cetera, blood culture, uh, and CSF culture. Start high-dose antibiotics as soon as you get that stuff, so vancomycin, ceftriaxone. If you're over 50 for adults, ampicillin. If you're under, uh, you know, we talked about the kids' stuff already, so I'm not going to rehash that. Dexamethasone. Um, sometimes steroids are given at very high doses if you have potential streptococcus pneumoniae pathogen. And that can be found via gram stain. So if you gram stain the CSF and you see, um, you know, gram positive cocci in chains, that's kind of indicative of strep infection. And that might be uh, something where you give the steroid. However, the evidence for this is inconsistent. Um, you do want to give it before you give antibiotics because it may diminish. Uh, otherwise, it may diminish the CNS penetration of vancomycin. Sorry, I misspoke there. Um, I meant to say give before. So you do, the recommendation for dexamethasone is to give it before antibiotics. However, there is a problem with that in that you can diminish CNS penetration of vancomycin. So it's not that if you do that after, you, you diminish penetration. The problem with vancomycin is it's a really big molecule and has a hard time getting into the central nervous system to begin with. So if somebody has meningitis, it can actually penetrate the CNS a lot easier because the meninges are flamed, inflamed and it, the whole CNS is a little bit more leaky. So vancomycin as a molecule can get in better. If you give steroids, it kind of can decrease that inflammation and shrink things back to normal size, locking the CNS up again. So the blood brain barrier is more intact. And that way, vancomycin has to go through different channels to get into the CNS. So um, that's the double edged sword with um, giving dexamethasone, is you're going to basically make it more difficult for vancomycin to get into the CNS. And you really want high vancomycin concentrations to be effective. So again, there's some debate there. And one way or another, I think they've shown that there is some evidence that, that pushes you towards um, using this just for strep pneumo, but I just want to be clear that this isn't something you use routinely for all meningitis cases. I've actually never seen it used, believe it or not. All right, uh, hypertensive crisis and urgency and emergency. So talking about blood pressure and how to treat it when it come, patient comes in and they have high blood pressure, uh, the old terminology was urgencies versus emergencies and I don't think I think that's kind of gone away but I still like to use it because it's a nice differentiation I think of like an urgency or an urgent situation as somebody who just has high blood pressure and nothing else they don't have symptoms um, they might have some minor signs of progressive end organ damage but probably not acute you know they have some edema or maybe a little bit of shortness of breath possibly a headache um, something like that. But otherwise, from a lab value perspective, you don't really see much going on. It's not like they're an acute heart failure or something like that. Um, with these patients, you should treat them orally. There's really no reason to give them an IV therapy um, and try to reduce their blood pressure over the next couple of days and follow up uh, within 72 hours. Uh, my biggest strategy for treating hypertensive urgencies is to look at their home meds. These patients probably are on a blood pressure med at home and um, if they aren't, you can you know, start wherever you want. But what I would do is look at their home med list and increase the dose of something that they're on. So let's say they're on lisinopril 10 milligrams at home. Well, let's bump it up to 20 or 40 even. Maybe add something else on too. Maybe add on um, like a calcium channel blocker and then have them follow up in 72 hours. Um, home monitoring is important too. So making sure they either have a monitor at home or can go somewhere where they can monitor or buy a monitor um, so that they can check their blood pressure so that they know it's not dropping too quickly. 
if you want something that works fast in the emergency department and can watch them in real time, I've got some options for you too. But generally speaking, you just want to add on to whatever their home regimen is and follow your guidelines. So if somebody's not on any blood pressure medications, you might want to start with you know, something based on the, the guidelines we talked about last fall. So starting a ACE inhibitor, ARB, calcium channel blocker, thiazide diuretic, or some combination. Your goal, you want to reduce blood pressure to 160 over 110, and then, um, but you don't want to do that too quickly. Decreasing blood pressure really fast can cause issues as well, so we want to avoid that if we can. If you Again, if you want to get something that works quickly, orally, in real time, you have a couple options. Captopril I almost never see used, so I'd probably ignore that one to begin with. Um, nicardipine, clonidine, and labetalol are probably the most common ones. Clonidine is the one I like um, because it's the fastest onset. And the nice thing about clonidine is there's not a lot of people that take clonidine chronically. Um, so if you have somebody coming in and they're on a couple other antihypertensives, you don't want to go up on the dose of those medications they're on, or maybe they're maxed out already. Clonidine's a nice choice because it's so fast acting and you get um, a medication with a mechanism that's not going to conflict with drugs you're already taking. You, know, you will see some people on clonidine occasionally, chronically, but it's it's pretty rare compared to you know your ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and calcium channel blockers. So nice thing is, again, Short acting, different mechanism, and uh, it's easily available and it's really cheap. So there you go. Uh, okay, so crisis or emergency is where somebody has severely elevated blood pressure. There's not really a cutoff here or, or description. Basically, you, you have elevated blood pressure, whatever that might be, plus uh, acute evidence of end organ damage, some stuff listed there. And you're going to treat this with IV, and you're going to be a bit more aggressive about it with your goals. I've listed out the different treatment options here. Uh, well, first of all, let me just be clear. I don't want you to know any of these parameters or you know different things here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm pointing with my hands, which you can't see. <laughs> um, I don't want you to know any of this stuff. I just want you to know that these options are fast. And honestly, I'd probably stick to, well, clonidine, nicardipine, labetalol. Just have those in your head as being the fastest onset orally. Um, as far as IV stuff goes, now it really depends on what you're treating and you tailor your therapy based on that. However, there are some really common themes. So one thing I would just keep in your mind is IV nicardipine and IV nitroprusside are going to be good choices for most things. You can see those on basically every list here. Um, nitroprusside, if you remember back to our lecture last fall, is probably the most broad, well I don't think broad spectrum is probably not the right word, but um, most potent uh, peripheral vasodilator. It's going to drop blood pressure very quickly. Uh, and the nice thing is it doesn't have any, if there's no effect on, you know, if the patient comes in and they're on a bunch of medications already for blood pressure management, it's not going to interfere with anything. It's not, it works differently, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, a lot of times people will combine something, so they might do like a, like for an aortic dissection, for example, well, severe bleeding, need to get to vascular surgery immediately, or they're probably going to die. Um, that's where we give nitroprusside plus like a um, some sort of a beta blocker usually. Um, you can see other cases down here too. So like for myocardial infarction, I don't usually see people with really high blood pressure, but usually they would start a nitroglycerin drip because that'll relieve pressure on the coronary vasculature. At the same time, it will drop their blood pressure a little bit, give them ischemic relief and, and decrease pain. So those, think about things like what we're already using for these cases and then how we can apply that to blood pressure and you're there but generally speaking you can't go wrong with um with nicardipine in most cases the only time we really don't use it is probably like a pulmonary edema situation where we're looking at um just probably a loop diuretic for the most part to get rid of that um if they are hypotensive then maybe nitroprusside nitroglycerin that's the only one where you really want to avoid it altogether Catecholamine excess is a is a one you aren't going to see a whole lot, and usually if you do see it, it's probably because they took um, a drug of abuse, usually benzos or sorry, usually cocaine or methamphetamine or some other sympathomimetic drug. In that case, probably just give them some Ativan, and that should calm them down a little bit um, and probably drop their blood pressure. But the big thing to do here is to avoid unopposed alpha 
um, activity. So the thing to think about with this is if you have a bunch of catecholamines in the body and you give a beta blocker, for example, what's going to happen is you're going to decrease that pressure on the heart, which is good, but you're also going to cause all those catecholamines to go to your alpha receptors and have have effect there. You also could do it the opposite. If you gave blocked all your alpha receptors and you shunt everything to the heart, and that's just as bad, if not worse. They're both bad. So the point is, is to use something that's not receptor specific. So like nitroprusside is a great drug for this. Nagcardipine and calcium channel blockers work well for this because they aren't going to work on those different, they're working on a different mechanism. Um, and again, um, approaching your drug of abuse situations with more of a like, let's give them something to calm them down type of the situation versus treating the blood pressure specifically. All right, so again, we have all these other ones, nicardipine, labetalol, nicardipine, labetalol, nicardipine, labetalol. What do we have on this slide just to review? Nicardipine, well, aortosection says nitroprusside. You can use nicardipine if you want to. I've seen it done before. Nitroprusside is generally recommended, again, just because it's more um, potent and it's going to work a little bit faster, but you can use nicardipine. And then we have labetalol, nicardipine. So, if you're getting my drift here, labetalol and nicardipine is almost always the right answer for blood pressure management. The way I approach it is, you know, do you want to give somebody boluses and bumps? Because that's where labetalol comes in nicely. I don't like labetalol continuous infusions because, uh, let me actually go to this slide while I'm talking about this stuff. Is labetalol on here even? There's labetalol. So I don't like labetalol continuous infusions because labetalol kind of lasts a long time and it it's hard to titrate. So your duration of action is like two to six hours, which is should be an outlier if you're going through this chart and being like, oh, 15, 30 minutes, 15, 30 minutes. What are these ones? You know, it's all pretty much the same with the exception of labetalol. Well, now prilet is weird. We don't really use this drug at all, so I should probably just remove it, but it does still exist. So anyway, um, labetalol is a super common one we like to use, but I like it in boluses. So you give a bolus of labetalol, you don't redose until you, you you know your time interval comes up. Labetalol infusions, I really don't understand how people can even try to titrate them. We do do it, and some providers will order it, especially some of our intensivists like it. I, again, have no idea. I've actually heard some interesting anecdotal stories from our ICU pharmacists about people who basically, like how it's almost impossible to manage because you, you're titrating labetalol, which has a slower onset. It has this really long duration of action. And by the time you actually get it to effect, you essentially overdose the patient on beta blocker at that point. So the better choice, in my humble opinion, as a pharmacist is Esmolol, which has a very fast onset and a very short duration of action. So beta blockers, as if you've listened to the tox lecture already, um, or if you're going to soon, uh, just a preview, are super toxic if you give too much of them, and it's difficult to reverse that effect. So I'm always a fan of using short-acting beta blockers if you're going to use them to acutely manage hypertension. And Esmolol is the drug of choice, in my opinion, here. So you can give an Esmolol drip. It's really easily titratable. It comes off quickly, way better than labetalol, unless you're talking about just using some one-time bumps. Labetalol is great for that. Um, and that could be nice, like if you have a patient who's sort of borderline high blood pressure and you don't want to send them to the ICU, you want to send them maybe to a med surge unit, it's one thing to keep in mind, and this is getting out of scope of this talk a little bit, but your hospital might restrict where patients can go based on what medications they're on. So like if you put somebody on a labetalol or a esmolol drip, they might say, eh, only patients can go on esmolol drips can go to ICUs or maybe a, a tele floor. And you're like, well, they don't need to go either one of those. Um, whereas if you gave them like a Q four hour labetalol PRN type thing, then they could go pro pretty much anywhere in the hospital and get that managed that way. So just something to consider. Um, so anyway, labetalol I like a lot for that reason, um, just not for the continuous infusion component of it. Um, nicardipine is the continuous infusion of choice for, again, basically every single option out there with that one exception of pulmonary edema. So that's it. That's basically all you need to remember for this. The other stuff on here, again, you'll use it situationally, like nitroglycerin for acute MI, nitroprusside, that really, really potent, almost immediately vasodilation effect, very fast offset as well. It's really easy to titrate and it comes off quickly. If you work in like a CV ICU, you'll probably see this a lot more, but um, we don't really use it. We use nicardipine a lot more like in the ED. Just another nice thing, and this is another side note, but 
that I wouldn't test you on for sure, but nicardipine comes as a pre-made bag, so you can like stock this on a unit and just pull it out and give one, whereas you have to make nit nitroprusside in like a sterile room. It doesn't come pre-made. So anyway, phenolbapam, never used it. Uh, don't expect you to know it. Um, Hydralazine is more of like a, an intermittent bump type of thing. We don't really use that as a direct infusion. Um, more commonly used for advanced like OB related hypertension. Not really commonly used for you know your average other indication. Naloprilat, never used it. Don't care you know it. Um, and then we talked about the beta blockers already. Phentolamine, I have never used that either. I just don't think there's a huge role for it. With the adrenergic crisis, there's, there's that component of you could give it in addition to a beta blocker and then you're blocking both sides of it, but it's just as easy to give nicardipine or nitroprusside. Okay. All right. Acute myocardial infarction. Uh, we've talked about STEMIs already a little bit, um, so I'm not going to go through this a ton anymore, but basically this usually gets called in the field. Patient needs to get to cath lab, and there's a few medications it could give it along the way. If your patient does stop in the ER, they're probably only there for a few minutes while cath lab's getting ready. Otherwise, the patients are usually direct admits to the cath lab. Um, Nitroglycerin for pain, whether it's sublingual or IV. Morphine, I rarely ever see morphine used, but it, it is the recommended option for patients with advanced chest pain. Um, usually nitroglycerin is enough for most patients, but you might see some morphine use. Aspirin load, um, EMS keeps aspirin. Excuse me, EMS keeps aspirin on hand, so this is almost always done prior to admission, unless the patient's showing up with their, you know, you know, somebody drove them to the hospital with chest pain and they weren't on aspirin previously. Antiplatelet loads. So there should probably be a sub bullet point here since it's under there. Whoops, that doesn't look very good. There you go. Um, ticagrelor, clopidogrel, prasigrel, they all have evidence for loading. We use ticagrelor, it has the best evidence for an acute phase use, um, just not very good evidence for sustained use. Uh, heparin load plus infusion. Maybe use bivalrudin as well. And then beta blockers aren't used very often. I think I've used a beta blocker once in the hundreds of STEMIs I've been in, and it was just because the patient was really tachycardic. It's very rare to actually need it. Um, so really your major drugs that everyone's going to get are going to be aspirin, your antiplatelet, and your heparin. Everything else on here is just symptomatic relief for the most part. Okay, ACLS. You guys are going to do ACLS at some point here, so I'm going to review a couple things. And there are a few doses I'm going to ask you to know for the exam, just because you'll have to know them for your ACLS test too, so figure why not know them for mine as well. They're pretty easy, and there's only a couple. With ACLS, usually medications are stocked um, around the hospital. We have things called crash carts that are these blue carts that sit around the hospital. And the top drawer has a bunch of meds in it. It looks kind of like this, a little different, but this is the basic idea is that you have a bunch of meds stocked in a tray that you can use in an emergency. So you have epinephrine, atropine, lidocaine, um, sodium bicarb, calcium, dextrose, dopamine drips, lidocaine drip, and then maybe some like flu, some diluents and some supplies and stuff like that. And then um, the rest of the cart has like airway supplies, it has like an ambu bag, it has gloves, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, oxygen on the cart as well. So pretty much everything you'd need for an emergency on a cart. Um, and then there's a couple medications that are sort of the core behind ACL algorithms. So epinephrine is one milligram IVIO. Uh, it's a beta and alpha agonist. We talk about epi. So it's going to hit your hearts and your lungs, provide you vascular support. It's a really intense, it's adrenaline is what you're giving somebody. So it's a really intense medication um, that, uh, you know, can correct an arrhythmia in certain situations. You can give it every three to five minutes. There's no max dose. You can give 100 epi doses if you want during a code. Um, that would be excessive and, and impractical, but it's technically not wrong. Um, or if the patient, um, you know, if you're giving boluses of epi during a cardiac arrest and the patient's responding to it, you can start a continuous infusion for them. That's more common. Vasopressin is another uh, vascular support agent that was recommended in place of the first or second dose of epinephrine. However, they don't recommend this anymore. It still might be something that some providers might use. There's nothing, there's no wrong reason to use it. They just didn't find good evidence behind it. The problem with cardiac arrest is there's not really good evidence for doing anything other than electricity. So, you know, they take that with a grain of salt. Um, sodium bicarbonate is something that you give one amp of, or one of these syringes is essentially 50 milliequivalents. And the reason why we do that 
during a uh, ACLS emergency is because the patients are usually acidotic, so it helps to correct that um, base imbalance. It also helps in hyperkalemia with driving potassium back into cells, and hyperkalemia is a really common reason why adults um, end up in cardiac arrest because they miss dialysis, they're hyperkalemic, and now here they are. Um, it's not technically a routine option. It's not really part of ACLS, so you won't see it as like a major algorithm, but I have never been in a code where I haven't given it, so it's pretty much routine. As far as dosing on this slide, the only one I want you to know is the one milligram of epinephrine, and that you can give it every three to five minutes. Repeat that, one milligram epi, Q3 to five, know it for the test, and know it for ACLS, because you'll, you'll have to know it there. Atropine. Uh, atropine's been on and off the algorithms for a while. It's recommended only at this point for symptomatic bradycardia, and at that point, because of the way it works, it works in the central nervous system on the vagal system to help block those impulses to make the heart rate kind of go back up. Um, you can, there's some theory that, so background, this used to be used for, uh, recommended for asystole, uh, and then it got taken off the ACLS algorithm because there wasn't any evidence for it. But there's some interesting theory that might make sense. So uh, consider this scenario, you have a patient who is symptomatically bradycardic. Their heart rate's going down and down and down and further. And then all of a sudden, um, they go into an asystolic rhythm. Well, their reason for going into that asystolic rhythm was because they're symptomatically bradycardic. So at that point, it actually does make sense to give atropine because that could help reverse that situation. Uh, but if you don't know why they're, they're asystolic or if they went from like a VTAC to an asystolic rhythm, then, well, that's different. Um, but just, you know, with that in mind, it's not technically wrong to give atropine during an asystolic cardiac arrest because they could actually be that way because of the bradycardia, and then it would make perfect sense. So um, I want you to know the dose, 0.5 milligrams um, every three to five minutes, max of three total. 0.5 to stay alive is the cute little rhyme they give you in ACLS to remember that one. Um, calcium chloride is another one kind of like bicarb where it's not routinely recommended, but it's one again where I've given it in every single code. What it does is it stabilizes the cardiac membrane. It's useful for hyperkalemia or possible toxicities like beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Dextrose, you can check blood sugars really easily. In fact, EMS probably already checked a blood sugar for you and they gave this already, so you don't really need to consider it. But if the blood sugar is low or you're going to give insulin to the patient and their blood sugar is normal, dextrose is available for that. Amiodarone. Um, you have to know amiodarone for the ex for the ACLS, but I don't want you to know it for my test. Um, it's an antiarrhythmic. It works quickly when given in fast doses. You can give 300 milligrams IV IO push uh, for pulseless VFib VTAC. Um, this would be for patients who are unresponsive to shock. So for people with shockable rhythms, which are VTAC and VFib, you're going to always want to use electricity first. Electricity has the best chance of getting the person back into a normal sinus rhythm. If electricity doesn't work, then you go to your drugs, and that becomes epinephrine and amiodarone. And so like in the case of a code, you, you start your CPR, you shock the patient, they don't come out. We've actually started doing stacked shocks now, which is a different concept, and ACLS I don't think is teaching that yet, but um, we actually went in a line, of, because side note, besides, ACLS only updates their stuff every so often, and so with, um, with uh, growing bodies of evidence and different strategies out there, it's like you don't really always want to wait until the next two years to, to update your staff. So we've actually started taking ACLS training in-house within Alina, and so we teach stack shocks now, which basically means you, st you shock a few times in a row. I think the recognition here is that electricity is the best option you have to save somebody's life in a pulseless VTAC VFib. So try and shock them out of it. If they shocking, electricity isn't working, Epinephrine can be given every three to five minutes, and then also you can do amiodarone, so that's where this comes in. If the person is an unstable VTAC, but they still have a pulse, you can give amiodarone. You just do it slowly over 10 minutes as opposed to pushing it. Lidocaine is an appropriate option as an alternative for amiodarone as an antiarrhythmic, but I rarely ever use it. Um, I think it probably depends on the provider. It is a little bit more toxic, and um, it's a little more difficult to dose. 
Uh, the pressers are all here. You can make presser drips to support. Oh my gosh, this thing wants me to restart so bad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you can make presser drips. Um, dopamine is usually the one we'll have available. It comes as a pre-made bag, so it's, you can stock it on a cart. The rest of these things need to be compounded by a sterile pharmacy, so they're diff more difficult to obtain. My general tips for ACLS, know your algorithms, know which ones you're in, know your rhythms, um, and then the drugs will kind of fall into place. Um, if you get the question, electricity generally trumps anything, assuming you have a uh, shockable rhythm. Um, as far as general tips, if you're in a code, communicate clearly. Um, know your doses or ask about the dose. Clarify the dose with the person drawing up the medications. Um, try and think and, and prepare a few steps ahead. Think of, okay, well, we're in asystole now. We're doing CPR. We just gave epi. All right, what are my next steps? What am I thinking about? What should I be looking at doing? Um, if you're working with another provider, be on the same page. My biggest frustration with codes is when I have an ED doc, um, a cardiologist, and an intensivist all in the same room with me, and they're all telling me three different things. It's really annoying. Um, so <laughs> granted, um, you know, there's situations where I don't know who's going to be leading what code, but if you are happen to be the code leader, you know, make sure all the decisions are going through you and you're prioritizing things correctly. And then there's heroic measures. You know, no... Knowing when to stop is an important thing and when you know the code is no longer worth trying. We can keep pumping somebody with Epi and keep them on a Lucas for you know indefinitely, but are they really alive at that point is a great question. Okay. Here's just some algorithms. I'm not gonna go through these because I don't care about the algorithms for my exam, just in case you're wondering where things go and where the medications slot in. One thing I will point out are the reversible causes here, which they're going to want you to know. Um, so these are going to be things for PEA or asystole. Um, always to think about your H's and T's. From my perspective, you know, there's a lot of stuff on here, but toxins would be like toxicology stuff we, you know, on the other lecture here. Thrombosis might be involved. So like if somebody has a big, massive PE, we can give like acutely give TPA um, push to the patient, and that can hopefully clear the clot, restore circulation, as an example. Other things are pretty easy to treat. Hypoxia, hypovolemia, uh, acid-base differences, kalemia, that type of stuff is relatively easy to treat with medications or simple interventions. Post-cardiac care, again, on here. Not really interested in talking about this. And here's the other algorithms. Again, not interested in spending any time on that. You can review it if you would like. I'm more interested to just know what drugs work where and which algorithms. Okay, uh, pulmonary stuff. Asthma exacerbations, we've talked about these already. Essentially, you're looking at steroids, oxygen, nubs, that type of stuff. Um, if it's really bad, you can do an IV steroid. Uh, but generally speaking, you can follow up with the patient just giving them a uh, steroid course five, seven days. And most patients will be able to discharge. CAP, we've talked about CAP already, but just to review, um, your common pathogens are listed there. Um, you know, have they had healthcare exposure or hospitalization from the past 90 days? Previous infections or cultures, any allergies are always things to think about when starting anyone on antibiotics. If you're going to discharge the person, um, just as a reminder, technically azithromycin is okay if you have less than 25% resistance. We don't, so it's not okay. <laughs> We have greater than 25% resistance in all of the United States. So that means um, your options are doxycycline as monotherapy, or you give a fluoroquinolone, like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, or you give azithromycin plus a third-gen cephalosporin or like a, a high-dose amoxicillin, something to cover that strep pneumo. So those are your options. You basically have three choices there. You do doxy, fluoroquinolone, or azithromycin, um, beta-lactam combo. Those three choices. 7 to 14 days for most. However, um, Leviquin is approved for a five-day course, so it's a little shorter. And it's once daily, making Leviquin, even though fluoroquinolones have their problems, very attractive for discharging somebody on. Once daily, five days, you can't beat that. All right. Uh, admitting a patient, it's very similar. And again, I'm not going to go through all these in detail. I would like you to know the general concepts of basically it, it's not going to change much unless you have different concerns. So you're really just covering your atypicals plus your strep pneumo. It, you go into more advanced areas of, of illness like hospital ICU admission requirements. You're going to be giving that IV only. Pseudomonas, 
is going to need additional coverage that way. So you're like, oh, I didn't realize we had to remember any of this stuff. And well, here it is. So it's a good review be before you go out on rotation. So you'll thank me later. Maybe, maybe not. Um, pulmonary embolism, uh, relatively common, massive versus submassive uh, criteria is there. Uh, it's high mortality rate without treatment. Um, treatment is basically anticoagulation, so um, we can discharge people with uh, a submassive PE and normal, you know, relatively asymptomatic people um, with uh, outpatient anticoagulation. So like rivaroxaban or apixaban would work for that. Um, you can admit somebody on a heparin drip too. Usually it's like three to six months of therapy. It could be indefinite depending on their risk or could be longer than that. Altoplace uh, can be used for PEs really only for a severe episode. If somebody has a massive PE but they're still some, mostly stable, you could consider like a two-hour infusion. Um, otherwise, if they are in a cardiac arrest, so if they're asystolic or PEA, remember these person in a cardiac arrest is very close to being dead if they aren't technically dead already. So if you want to really treat them aggressively, uh, and that's going to be push TPA. So you might say, you push Altoplace? Yeah, you do in that situation. So you give a big bolus of Altoplace through a huge syringe and just kind of smash it into the patient. Hopefully it breaks up that clot fast. Yes, there's some bleeding risk there, but the alternative is them dying. So, you know, you take the risks and the benefits there. It's a great thing if you work in emergency medicine to keep in the back of your mind. You have a young person coming in, especially like a woman maybe who's postpartum, or on birth control or something like that, where their venous thromboembolism risk is higher, they come in with a cardiac arrest, they're otherwise healthy, it's probably a PE. So sometimes people will, they won't even do imaging or anything, they'll give TPA just, you know, because it's probably that, they won't even like consider it, which is a very expensive intervention, but at the same time you're talking about somebody's life. So yeah, anyway, that's my story about that. Um, gastrointestinal stuff, mostly GI bleeds is what you'll see. Um, ulcerations, esophageal varices uh, are most common ones I see. NSAID use might be an anticoagulation, antiplatelet use. Symptoms are going to be abdominal pain, emesis, melana, tarry stools, or frank blood, depending on where the bleeding is. Supportive care fluid boluses, transfusions, of course. Um, we try and lower the pH of the GI tract with IV pantoprazole or esomeprazole. Those are the two IV PPIs we have. So we give big boluses of pantoprazole usually. Um, and then if they have esophagastric variceal bleeding, then IV actreotide works. Um, it limits or inhibits serotonin release and has some ultimately vasoconstrictive effects downstream that prevent bleeding. Um, that's more common in alcoholic patients, just in case you're wondering what type of patient population presents with this. Um, starting the antibiotic as well uh, in these cases is usually indicated, um, and then getting them to surgery if they need to be, especially if they have a really massive bleed. GI infections, usually like if somebody comes in with an appendicitis, um, requires surgery, you're probably just going to start be starting antibiotics and referring them to the surgeon. Surgeon's probably going to have a recommendation for what antibiotics they want. You know, generally speaking, they're gonna, they should be covering gram negatives and anaerobes, and that's going to be something like a cephalosporin. My favorite is ceftriaxone metronidazole. It's cheap. It covers everything you need to. However, um, some GI surgeons like to get fancy, and they want zosin, or they want a carbapenem, or something like that, and it's not necessarily wrong. It's just maybe overkill in some cases, so I don't usually argue with them, but again, you might get different opinions from GI surgeons than what you might personally pick, and that's that's okay. We usually just go with what they want. All right, a couple other things, psych emergencies. Uh, with This is just a side note, but when I started in emergency medicine, we would have maybe like one or two psych patients in the department at a time, and usually they were um, you know, just waiting admission or transport somewhere. Now it's pretty common to have between five to 10 psych patients in the department at any time in a holding pattern, waiting replacement, waiting for a bed to open up. I'm not sure what exactly has happened in the last 10 years that's changed how we have psychiatric care, but it's become a really big deal. And um, 
it's actually become this, uh, it was sort of a kind of a crisis for a lot of hospitals in the metro because we just didn't have any space. So a lot of emergency departments have sort of restructured their workflow to make sure that they have enough beds to hold psych patients. So a lot of times what you get is you get a psych patient, it comes in suicidal to the emergency department. There's no bed for them in the metro area, so they just sit in the ER. And law says that you can't just transfer them. So you can't be like, oh, Fairview, let's say they come to a line and I say, well, Fairview is going to have a bed open tomorrow for this patient. So I'll just send them to Fairview's ER. It doesn't work like that. You can't transfer them to another ER. You actually have to transfer them to the actual place they're going. So if they st get stuck at an ER, they're stuck there until something opens up. So with that, with all the psych uh, related admissions, if you work in emergency medicine, you're going to see a ton of psych related stuff, of course. Um, and agitations are really common, acute display of psychiatric emergency. So how do we treat that? How do we calm the patient down so they don't hurt themselves or hurt staff? Uh, there's a couple options. The most popular one right now is to give them olanzapine, um, IM. A zyprasidone can work too, but olanzapine is the more common one. The other choice is the older one <coughs> is the B52 cocktail, <coughs> which is Benadryl, which is the B5 is haloperidol, 5 milligrams, and lorazepam is 2. Um, people think that that's an offensive term, the B-52 bomber, because you're kind of slamming somebody with a bunch of medications that are sedative. Um, I still say it just because it's commonly referred to that in real life. So I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be offensive at all, but I just wanted to be realistic with you guys and what people call, call this thing. Um, the nice thing about the B-52 is that we don't use it really anymore. So um, it's fallen out of favor, mostly because haloperidol causes so much EPS, and this is just it's, it, it's insanely sedating. Somebody who gets this is going to be knocked out for like 12 hours straight. I don't know. That's excessive, but you get the point. It's, it's not, it's, it's heavily sedating versus the other ones are a little bit less. So olanzapine doesn't cause EPS. It's not quite as sedating. It'll still calm the patient down. It'll be somewhat sedating for them, but overall, it's a much better option, much safer option for the patients. That's what we tend to use. Droperidol has actually come back, um, which is interesting. And so that's another one that, uh, as far as I am used, you might see it used occasionally. Um, it does cut, it's like a mini Haldol that doesn't last as long. It doesn't cause as much EPS, but still can. So it's another thing to just be, be careful of. Um, if somebody can take oral, they're maybe a little agitated, but not, you know, off the rails yet. You could give them an olanzapine orally dissolving tablet that'll work a little faster. And then ultimately there's ketamine. Ketamine is sort of the last resort. This is a very agitated patient who's aggressive, hurting people, hurting staff, you know, have to be pinned down by five security guards type of situation. And um, you give IM ketamine in this case. Pretty big doses. Uh, it's usually anywhere from five to ten mg per kg IM. So it can be like, I've given like half a gram or a gram of ketamine, which is a lot, but that's just the way it is. That's how it, it doesn't, it's very different from IV dosing. I think about it as like double what you'd give somebody IV. So if you're looking at dosing, you're like, why is it so different? The absorption is much less if you give it ion, so you'd have to dose it quite a bit higher. Uh, shock, there's a lot of different types of shock out there. Um, generally speaking, you're looking at inadequate circulation. So deciding whether you need blood pressure support, fluid boluses, pressors, um, intubation, possibly. I'm not going to go through that anymore. Um, sepsis, we've talked about sepsis a lot last fall, but just to review, um, antibiotics are key. We want to try and identify the source. If you don't, go broad. Um, if you ever get the question from your nurse, which agent do I start first? Start your gram-negative agent first. Basically, your cefepimazos and primaxin, that's going to be your workhorse antibiotic. So you want to make sure that's on board first. Vancomycin comes separately because all vancomycin does, remember, is control MRSA. It doesn't do anything else. They're just definitions there. Uh, for anaphylaxis, you have a severe allergic reaction, um, can present in shock. For this, mostly you're looking at airway protection. If you need to intubate somebody, that's uh, an option. If you um, otherwise um, sub Q or IM epinephrine, um, usually. 0.3 milligrams IM. If they're a child or a smaller adult, 0.15 milligrams. And really little, you have a smaller dose there. Um, albuterol, ipratropium nebs to help the airway, IV corticosteroids, diphenhydramine as an antihistamine, and then um, we give famotidine as well. If you're going to give Benadryl, the, the, the issue with 
having a lot of histamine in the body after an anaphylactic response. And you give Benadryl, you're blocking histamine 1 receptors, which can shunt a lot of histamine to histamine 2, which can have um, problematic effects on the stomach. So it's actually just stomach protective is really one of the only reasons why we give uh, something like an H2 blocker to prevent that shunting of histamine. EpiPens. Uh, most patients who have anaphylaxis history will have one of these available. But um, if they don't, EMS has this type of stuff as well. We don't use EpiPens in the hospital because they're really expensive. So we just pull up it in an IM syringe and inject that way. Hyperkalemia. Uh, all right. So we've talked about this already, but just to review, because this is another really common ED presentation. Um, our big thing here is EKG changes is the first step. So peak T waves, stuff like that. Do you see that? If you don't, you can skip to step two. If you do, give calcium chloride right away. It can help stabilize the cardiac membranes. If you start to see EKG changes with hyperkalemia, the patient is close to having a cardiac arrest. You want to treat that somewhat aggressively. Step two, um, if you remember, your step two insulin's your core here. So you want to make sure that the patient's blood sugar is not going to bottom out. If they're hypoglycemic already, then you definitely want to give dextrose. If they're normal glycemic, you want to give dextrose. If they really have high blood sugar, you can probably get away with just the insulin and ignore the dextrose altogether. Um, so insulin is going to be your primary choice here. You have a couple other things you can give. Um, sodium bicarb, NEBS are optional, but they will help drive potassium into the cells as well. Um, if you have somebody who is presenting with uh, hyperkalemia and they sort of have a mild case and no symptoms, Lasix might be a good option because it'll help excrete some of the potassium over time. Um, it also has some sustained effects too. So if you want to give Lasix, just know it won't work quickly, but you know, after several hours, it might help waste some extra potassium. Uh, sodium polystyrene is an oral option that exchanges sodium for potassium. It takes about 24 hours. It's sort of the last option, but if you want, again, a more sustained approach to it so that they don't rebound into hyperkalemia. That's the drug you can give. Um, diabetic ketoacidosis, same type of thing. Uh, sorry, not the same type of thing. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I was thinking um, of a totally different thing. Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so this is going to be blood sugar above 800. We've talked about this already again, and uh, during diabetes, we mentioned it. So treatment, fluid replacements, uh, usually with potassium. Remember, we just talked about insulin use, being used to drive potassium back into the cell. So if you give somebody a lot of insulin to get their blood sugar down, their potassium is going to drop too. So usually we replace fluids with potassium and sometimes sodium bicarb too, depending on um, their pH status and their acidosis status. Uh, insulin, high doses, IV infusion, usually with a bolus, uh, monitoring blood glucose and potassium frequently. All right, that's EM in a nutshell, covering a ton of topics. Again, a lot of these topics we've talked about already, so feel free to review. Um, if you have any questions, let me know, but um, that's the, the majority of things that uh, represent emergency medicine. It's kind of a mixed bag, a lot of different systems affected, uh, but you can really see anything, which makes it fun and also challenging to work in emergency medicine.